Hey guys, I'm Heidi Preeb. Welcome back to my channel or welcome here if this is your first time here. So on this channel this week, we are doing a series where we talk about the three insecure attachment styles. So that's avoidant, anxious, and fearful avoidant, and what their main blind spot is when it comes to romantic relationships or attachment relationships in general. So this video is going to be a little bit different than the other two. When we talked about the avoidant and the anxious attachment styles, we talked about the fact that each of those two has a blind spot in the opposite area. So avoidant attachment strategies tend to over rely on information and cognition to make decisions about attachment relationships, and they under rely on information about their own emotional experience, which is often kind of hidden to them by their own minds. And then on the anxious side of things, we have the opposite. We have someone who is over relying on the way that they feel and under relying on logic and their ability to make self-responsible, self-protective choices for themselves. So in each of those cases, what we were looking at was how to develop an awareness of the other side of the attachment spectrum and integrate that into the pre-existing strategy that you already use. With fearful avoidant, there is a very different and unique situation that arises, which is that those with fearful avoidant attachment styles have access to all of the information that both avoidance and anxiously attached people have about their own attachment systems. So you're in touch with that part of yourself that can over rely on logic and cognition and trying to figure out what makes sense in an attachment relationship at the expense of your feelings. But then you can flip to the other side and for a period of time over rely only on your emotional experience at the expense of logic. So it's not that you need to develop an awareness of either side, you have an awareness of both sides. It's that you need to learn how to integrate those two sides. So rather than functioning one way until you get triggered into the opposite direction and then suddenly operating in the complete opposite way for a period of time, which is very disorienting to both you and your partners, you need to learn how to operate from a little bit of both strategies and how to integrate those two things in order to have a secure or balanced worldview. Because the brilliant thing is that secure people, like you, have strong access to both their emotions, their feeling states, they have body awareness, they can use that awareness to inform them about how they're feeling in attachment relationships, and they have access to logic, to cognition, to figuring out and kind of critically analyzing why people might be behaving the way that they are. The difference is that for secure people, they know when to use each of those strategies so they have a better understanding and higher degree of control over when they're choosing to either logically analyze something or trust their emotions and follow their gut impulses on something. And in most cases, they're able to strike a balance between the two. So they don't live in a state of thinking that one side or the other is bad. They don't live in a state of thinking one side or the other is shameful. They live in a state of going emotional information is important information. Cognitive rational information is important information. When I'm making decisions about my attachment relationships, I'm going to check in both with what I feel and with what I can kind of reason to be a logical, thorough decision and I'm gonna find the happy medium between those two in order to inform my decisions. The problem with fearful avoidance is that you have access to all of this information, but you don't have an ability to use it all at the same time. So let's talk about how this plays out in romantic relationships and how this lack of integration can become a blind spot that keeps you repeating the same types of relationship mistakes over and over again. So all three insecure attachment styles tend to have some degree of this experience of going into a relationship and going, okay, I'm gonna do things differently than last time, right? I learned from my last experience, I learned from what I've been through, and in the future, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not making the same mistakes again. 
But often what happens when we do that is we look at what went right. So we go, okay, some things went wrong in that relationship, but there was a lot of things I did really well, or maybe there were a lot of things that were functioning very well for a period of time. And so next time, what I'm gonna make sure I do is double down on what I know I do well, and then maybe try to find a partner who just doesn't bring the other side out in me. And this is a particularly problematic strategy for the fearful avoidant because when you are fearful avoidant, you get triggered in opposite directions. So by default, you have this very activated response that can come online when you get triggered into your anxious, preoccupied type of wounding, where you can become very desperate and needy and feeling as though your body is on fire, you need to get someone's attention, you need to get them to notice you, to attend to your feelings, or else something terrible is going to happen, right? So you have experience with that activation response but you also have experience with deactivation. So when you get triggered in a way that causes you to deactivate from your attachment system, you're suddenly gonna be looking at things from a very kind of cold, detached lens. You might suddenly feel like this switch has gone off and you have no interest in a relationship that for a long period of time you were very interested in and you can't seem to get your feelings back. But most fearful avoidance spend more time in one of their responses than the other. So this is often what people are talking about when they say they lean either anxious or avoidant if they're fearful avoidant. What I take that to mean is that if you lean anxious, it means that the majority of the time that you are consciously aware of your attachment patterning, you are feeling more preoccupied. You are feeling as though you are gaining a lot of your sense of self-worth and validation out of other people. You might feel as though you are chronically kind of looking to be defined through your relationships, but you also have an awareness, if you're fearful avoidant, that when the pressure is on or in certain types of situations, you can deactivate and you can flip into that more avoidant kind of detached style of reasoning. And if you lean avoidant as a fearful avoidant, it means that most of the time you consciously experience yourself as a little bit more reserved, a little bit removed from the need to have attachment relationships, not particularly valuing of your own or other people's emotions, but sometimes a flip goes off and you get triggered into that anxious wounding where suddenly you become very activated and hyper aware of your own emotions. And so the degree to which you live your life in either strategy is going to differ person to person. So some fearful avoidance oscillate quite a bit between these two strategies. Others might find they spend like 75% of their time in kind of a low level state of deactivation and then 25% of their time in hyperactivation or vice versa. But what's going to happen is that you are going to begin, like any human being does, to define yourself based on the way that you most consistently perceive yourself to be experiencing yourself. So what I mean by that is that if you are a fearful avoidant who leans more avoidant, you're likely to define yourself in terms of being someone who's maybe more rational, more analytical, maybe an intellectual. And you might develop this kind of embarrassment around the fact that you know there's also this other side to you that can be quite impulsive, emotional, whatever it is. And on the flip side, if you define yourself as someone who is more often in their anxious patterning, you're likely to have an identity that fixates more on you being a kind of very good, very selfless, very innocent and giving person. And you might be kind of embarrassed about the fact that you know you're not always the most caring or the most compassionate or the most committed when you get into romantic relationships. So most fearful avoidance, I find, develop a social mask that they use most of the time when they're navigating their day-to-day -day life that reflects one part of their strategy and neglects the other to a fairly significant degree. And I think that whichever one you pick tends to be a reflection of what worked best for you when you were younger. So if most of the time in your early life it worked for you to be a little bit more detached, a little bit more analytical, a little bit more removed from your emotional experience, you're probably still most comfortable spending most of your time in that type of response. And the same is true in the opposite direction. If what worked for you as a child was showing other people how innocent and vulnerable you were, you're probably going to still feel as though that's where you're comfortable spending more of your time. And then we get into attachment relationships and the pressure switch turns on, right? When you get into a romantic relationship, whatever is in your attachment system 
will eventually arise. That's just how it works. So if you are fearful avoidant, but you lean more towards avoidance, you will at some point in a romantic relationship get triggered into that preoccupied anxious energy. And the same is true in the opposite direction. If you lean more anxious, you will at some point, if you're fearful avoidant, get triggered in your attachment relationships into that deactivating, cold kind of calculating worldview. And so what I hear a lot of fearful avoidance saying when they get out of a bad relationship is I lost myself in that relationship because you have this idea of yourself that is kind of one way or the other. And then you see this opposite part of yourself come out in the relationship and you go, well, what's the common denominator here? It's this other person. I'm not usually like this in other scenarios. I don't usually get all worked up like this, or I don't usually get this kind of cold and detached like this. So it must be that this other person brought that out in me. And if I can just go into a different relationship with someone who doesn't bring that out in me, I can continue to be the person that I know myself to be when I'm out of relationship, which is that strategy that you prefer to depend upon. The error that is getting made here, and this is the error that will keep you stuck in a pattern of repeating the same types of relationships over and over and over again until you solve this, is that you did not lose yourself in a relationship if you are a fearful avoidant who had the other side of your attachment system triggered by a partner, you found a part of yourself in that relationship that you are normally very skilled at repressing and not letting other people see. Now, what this does not mean is that that part of yourself is this terrible, shameful secret that you have to keep hidden at all costs. I think that is what a lot of fearful avoidance kind of intuitively, instinctively feel in their bodies to be true is that the part of their attachment system that they're not as comfortable with is this kind of monster that lives inside of them that they're hiding from the world. And they have to find a way to hide it better and better and better. And they have to go into new relationships with better hiding strategies. But the solution to this problem, unfortunately, is to do the exact opposite. Our attachment patterning, our attachment responses, particularly the ones that come online when the pressure gets really high, are not going to go anywhere magically, and we can only hide them for so long. If they're in there at some point when the pressure is high, they're going to come out. I want to reiterate, I often see fearful avoidant people going into relationships and being like, this time I'm going to hold it together, I'm going to make sure that I'm playing to my strengths, and what ends up happening is that Instead of their partner seeing their kind of other side, if you will, early on in the relationship, it happens later on because they've learned to effectively suppress it for longer. But then what happens is that it's extra dysregulating for their partner when this sudden very opposite side to how their partner usually behaves comes out. So now it's probably even more upsetting and causing even more chaos in the relationship than it would have if their partner had just seen that side of them earlier on. And so this can actually become a kind of escalating cycle of increasingly more chaotic relationships because you are trying harder and harder to suppress something that actually needs to be integrated. So what does that mean? If you have a facet of your attachment system that you frequently neglect, it's kind of like the pressure in that area is just getting stronger and stronger. And then finally, when the lid comes off, you're going to feel all of it at once, whether that's this extreme preoccupation, activation, anger, whatever it is, or whether it's this extreme form of disgust towards other people, this extreme form of judgment and self-righteousness, whatever it is you're suppressing is going to come out. In order to stop the cycle of this coming out at extreme extremely inopportune moments, like when you and your partner are going through your first serious conflict or your first serious life transition that's putting you under a lot of stress, you need to learn to open that box a little bit and keep it open constantly. Now, this is going to require you to put down a very significant part of your ego. Because if you are someone who defines yourself as a little bit more avoidant, a little bit more logical, analytical, you might pride yourself on how many strong emotions you do not feel, you are going to have to accept that actually there is a part of you that is quite emotional, that is quite reactive, that can be quite needy, and that really does crave close connected relationships. And you're going to have to find a way to work that part of yourself into your overall identity. So when new people meet you, when new romantic interests meet you, 
they don't see you as this kind of very detached analytical person who completely has their shit together all of the time. They're going to see the full you, which includes that analytical intellectual side of yourself, but it also includes the side of yourself that is vulnerable and that knows that they need relationships in order to feel fulfilled and happy and who can be open to learning through relationships. And if you lean more avoidant, that's probably a really scary thought. And on the flip side of this, if you are someone who likes to think of yourself as kind of chronically innocent and always doing things for the good of other people and never doing anything strategically or never making decisions that upsets other people, it's going to be difficult for you to accept that actually there is a significant part of you that is quite self-interested, that can flip into this mode where all of a sudden you are not concerned at all with your partner's experience and you are just focused on your own. And again, this is not an altogether negative thing. Secure people know when it's time to co-regulate and when it's time to take a step back and tend to their own needs with compassion and boundary is the difference, right? So what often you'll see with fearful avoidance is that there is this fear that if they are to integrate what they normally try to repress, they're going to become the unhealthy version of that thing. So if you lean avoidant and you start integrating the emotional parts of your experience, that does not mean you're going to become an emotional mess. If anything, if you are doing it well with help, and we're going to talk about what that looks like, you're going to be able to understand when is it the appropriate time for me to be making decisions based on my emotions versus when is it the appropriate time for me to be thinking about what makes sense and making decisions based on logic. And when you learn discernment and you learn how to look at both sides of things and decide which one it makes sense to prioritize a little bit more heavily right now, it makes a world of difference. Because what happens when you have this information disintegrated is that you're not deciding, right? You're going along making decisions based on either emotion or logic most of the time. And then in moments when you don't expect it, the other side comes online screaming and suddenly you want to do everything completely differently than you've wanted to do things for let's say the past two months. Or if you're someone who gets triggered in different directions quite often, this could be a day-to-day -day thing. And that makes it really hard to make long-term plans, to make decisions about important relationships, to even know how you feel about a relationship or where you want it to go because you're never looking at both sides at once. So what does it look like to do that? To do that, I recommend making a practice that is intentional and deliberate for a long period of time around integrating the part of yourself that you are less comfortable with. So for myself, this meant accepting that I am someone who is not always purely calm, regulated and rational. There are times when I get triggered and I can become hyper activated. I can become hyper angry. I can feel desperate for my partner to see my point of view or else I feel in my body that I will not be okay. And by the way, this is something that everybody who is insecurely attached feels at some point or another, especially when you start working with your attachment system. Because we have kept these things kind of cooped up inside of us for so long, they come out as very extreme responses when they come out, when in reality, what we want to do is diffuse that response so that we're feeling a little bit of it at the appropriate moments all the time. So instead of repressing all of our feelings and then exploding, we want to be staying in touch with what we're feeling on a consistent basis and bringing up our emotional experience when it's appropriate, not when we've been resisting it for so long that it can only come out like a volcano erupting, right? So if you lean more avoidant as a fearful avoidant, I recommend you make a practice daily if possible of sensitizing yourself to your emotional experience so that can look like doing meditative exercises that drop the focus out of your head where you're most comfortable and into your body and actually learning what it feels like to respond to your life, not just from your thoughts, but from your felt lived experience and then finding safe spaces where you can share that experience. So if you've been around this channel for a while, you've probably heard me plug 12 step programs, which you can absolutely be an atheist to attend and to work the step. I am not a follower of any religious group and I have been benefiting hugely from working the steps in these programs. But what going to meetings in groups like, let's say, Codependence Anonymous, Adult Children of Alcoholic and Dysfunctional Families Anonymous will help you do 
is give you a space to share your emotional experiences in a safe environment that is designed to be non-triggering. So it can be really hard to go from always repressing your feelings to suddenly sharing them with everyone, right? That is a huge, huge leap to make. So what I recommend you do, whether this is through therapy, through support groups, through a friend who you've made a mutual commitment to trying to become more emotionally honest with, is make some sort of practice out of getting in touch with your emotional experience and sharing it in contained environments a little bit every single day. Now, if you are on the other side of the spectrum, if you air more anxious, and then you find that you have deactivation responses that come online in attachment relationships, you're going to need to start working with that. Deactivation responses can be a little bit trickier to work with because they are more subtle. They pull you out of your body and into your head, which is the opposite of an anxious response, which tends to pull you out of your head into your body. But then when you get deactivated, it's like all of a sudden, all of the emotions you've been feeling are kind of absent from your awareness and all you can see is all of the problems, all of the faults in your partner, all of the reasons why X, Y, or Z won't work. And in order to make that a more integrated experience for yourself, what you're gonna need to do is find a way to make a practice out of analyzing your relationships from a more objective standpoint. So whether that is going into therapy, whether that is also doing group work or group programs, whether that is journaling day to day, your work is going to be about learning to take yourself out of the romantic fantasy that you often get stuck in and learn to see your relationship more consistently and evenly for what it is. So this might mean welcoming back feedback on your relationship from friends who you know are a little bit more objective than you. It might mean making sure you're keeping a running list of what you're looking for in a partnership on a practical level and whether or not your relationship is matching up with that. It also is likely to mean being very firm with yourself about making sure that you are keeping up with your life and your commitments outside of the relationship. If you tend to get very enmeshed and go full on into the relationship and then down the line get deactivated and go, whoa, 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 I've lost myself. All the things I used to love I'm no longer doing. I need to get out of this relationship immediately in order to get myself back. Your work might be in being very strict with yourself in making sure that when you get into a relationship, you are not changing your life in highly significant ways that you are going to begin to resent down the line. So this might look like picking certain activities, certain commitments that are just yours and holding yourself responsible for maintaining those activities and maintaining that independent life outside of your relationship, even in the times where you want to go full into the relationship, no holds barred. And the idea is that at the end of this process, you want to arrive at a place where you are no longer centering your identity around a portion of who you are. Where instead of seeing yourself as a person who is mostly one way, but then there's this crazy side of you that comes out in relationships, you're seeing yourself as a person who behaves consistently inside and outside of relationships, which is how secure people are, right? Of course, there are ways we act with our partners that we wouldn't act with our friends in terms of physical affection and the degree of emotional intimacy or the plans we make about the future. But when it comes to your actual personality, like who you are as a person, how someone else would describe you, the description your partner gives or would be able to give secretly should be pretty consistent with how your friends or family members or colleagues would describe you. There should not be this massive discrepancy between how you behave in attachment relationships and how you behave day to day. And so you will know that you are ready to go back into an attachment relationship and have it be highly likely that it will turn out differently from the way things have turned out in the past when you have integrated that other side of you. So for myself, because I've traditionally leaned more avoidant on the fearful avoidant side of things, I made a deal with myself when I got out of my last serious partnership that I'm not allowed to go back into another long-term romantic relationship until I have at least five friends who I have true emotional intimacy with. Because a big problem I had was I would not be emotionally intimate on a true deep level with anyone other than my partner, which then made becoming codependent on my partner very easy because I didn't have those support systems outside of the relationship. I had to be attending meetings and going to therapy and having people who knew the side of me that normally only comes out in partnerships when I'm under extreme stress. If you lean anxious, the work might be letting people see you as not 
purely vulnerable and innocent. It might be learning to be honest with other people about the mistakes that you're making, about the ways in which you're behaving selfishly through trying to get your needs met through other people, and the ways in which you tend to neglect yourself in favor of a relationship. You need to be able to build a life where people see that side of you and where you learn that it's actually healthy to operate from both sides. Secure people have their own worlds and their own lives and they know when it's time to be a little bit selfish and self-protective. And because they don't see that as a negative thing, they have a much easier time resolving conflicts because they can just take accountability for when they're doing that instead of needing to make it seem like they're always innocent and vulnerable and never in the wrong. And secure people also have an awareness of their emotional experience. They don't think it's shameful or wrong or a flaw to have feelings, and so they can comfortably express them on a consistent basis. They don't kind of hold them in until they all explode at once. And so the cool part of all of this is that the more you integrate this part of yourself that at this point you might think is so shameful and needs to get hidden at all costs, the more secure you become the healthier a person you become, and the easier it actually becomes to connect with people across the board. The problem is not that you are not hiding this part of yourself well enough, it's that you're not exposing it to air enough, right? Things need oxygen to function properly. And when we keep these parts of ourselves compartmentalized, shoved away, when we don't ever let them see the light of day, they grow kind of weird and messed up inside of us. And then when they come out, they come out in weird, messed up ways. But if we were just learning to crack open the lid on these parts of ourselves that we normally repress, let other people see them, people we trust, therapists, people in support groups, friends and family who we have really close trusting relationships with if we have the luxury of having those types of relationships. The more we expose those stowed away parts of ourselves to oxygen, the more they learn to breathe and grow into healthier expressions of themselves. And when we have those healthy expressions of either our emotion or our logical thought process up and running, it becomes way easier to show them to other people because they're not all like weird and disheveled from getting kept in the basement for so long. They just are what they are. So the end goal, I've said it before and I'll say it again, of healing from fearful avoidant attachment is learning to be the same person everywhere you go. And that might feel impossible right now if you are very much in a state of repressing one side or the other. And just know it is a slow, long process. I would love for there to be a hack, but there's not a hack. All I can promise you is that at the end of the day, if you're able to go through this process and very slowly learn how to let those parts of yourself that you usually keep hidden see the light of day, as well as which situations it's safe for you to do that in, you are going to develop this incredible sense of discernment that is going to allow you to choose healthy relationships that you can show up as a whole person to, probably for the first time in your life. And I can tell you for sure that is worth all of the work. No ego trip is ever going to feel as grounded and calm and good in a true sense of the word as knowing that you are going into every new relationship not having to hide anything because you don't think that anything about yourself is inherently broken and shameful anymore. And that's a feeling I will always, always encourage people to do the work to fight for because there is not anything broken or wrong or inherently flawed with any of us. We just stow certain things away because we get ashamed of them and then they get all weird inside of us and we just have to learn how to take them out and nurture them back to life in a healthy way. And that's what this process is all about. All right, that's all I have to say for today on fearful avoidance and the integration process that is going to allow you to stop getting into the same types of relationship drama over and over again. As always, let me know in the comments what you guys are thinking, what's coming up for you as you're watching this. And also, as always, I love you guys. I hope you're taking care of yourselves and each other and your inner children. And I will see you back here again really soon.